<laughs> Thank you very much. Um, well, hello, good evening, good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are, whoever you are, wherever you're watching this. I am at uh, CTS Studios, Wembley, England, with uh, my invited audience and also you guys at home. How many right-handed drummers we got in the audience? Uh, we got a few guys here. Uh, how many left-handers, lefties in the audience? Any? If you're left-handed, either turn the video around the other way and watch it backwards. <laughs> <laughs> no. Everything I'm saying for, is for right-handed people, because naturally that's what I am, I'm a righty. So whatever I'm saying, you just turn it around. So any right, hand, right foot and left hand, you turn it left foot, right arm, right hand. So I'm going to cover a little bit of uh, the areas with uh, little patterns for people. To, how many people are just starting out playing, playing for a couple of years, three years? Anybody? All been playing, yeah? No, but how many years have you all been playing? A few? Nine months. Well, there you go. So, okay, this, what we're going to cover today is really sort of stuff on the, on the lines for beginners or people that have been down the road three or four years that maybe have a little bit of a problem with the left side of the, the left hand working for them. Then what we're going to do, yeah, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about a bit of stamina stuff, you know, for people that have been playing. I've had a, I'm doing some teaching, right, and some people have asked me, why is it they get, they get tired from when they rehearse? And they play and they, they, you know, you rehearse for three or four weeks, three or four months, whatever. And you go and do a gig. How many, is, how many times has this happened to you guys? You get halfway through it and you think, gee, man, I've got lead weights around my wrist. Or I'm using lead drumsticks. Now, this can happen. I mean, it certainly happens to me. So I'm going to cover an area which is like pacing yourself. And we're going to get into that a little later. So what I'd like to do is um, I'm going to bring on another drum kit for you before we carry on. <laughs> uh, and we're going to play uh, a kit, another kit for you. I'm going to show you a couple of patterns, and then we'll talk a little bit further about um, stamina and techniques, and some patterns and bass drum technique and all that good stuff. Okay. Anybody got any questions so far? Yeah, you sir. How do I tune my, my drum kit? Uh, okay. Well, I'd like to introduce to you Steve Gadd, my drum tech. He's a geezer. Round of applause for the man, please. Yes! <laughs> all right, that's enough. Go on. Go on. Go on. You know, that's enough. Watch out. Now, here we have. Anybody recognise this? <laughs> it is a drum, yeah. <laughs> right. This is off my, uh, my black kit from the Summer End Time Tour. Remember that? All black chrome. Sweet, isn't it? Right, what I'll do is, this is the bottom head. I'll take the top head off. Right. Get the bottom head, give him a little tweak up. Now, what I usually do, you've got to imagine this, is that all the top, all the top heads, because it's a nine tom, tom kit, floor tom, 11. Sorry, nine and, nine and one's 11, yeah, that's good, isn't it? Nine hanging toms, right, six down through 16, 18 by 19 floor tom. So I'll take all the top heads off, starting with the floor tom, I'll work up. And we just tune up the bottom head somewhere in the re sort of region of the note that I'd like to wear this particular drumming. Now, I'm, I'm sort of going blind with this at the moment, sort of from memory, because I don't have the others to relate to. But I... I'll tune it up so it's pretty, pretty close... pretty close to... Um, taking longer than I thought. To the, <laughs> to the sound. Now, I've just noticed, obviously, the, the best people say, well, why do you do opposites? Well, the reason for that is sometimes when you put the, the rim on the skin, on the drum, if it goes on tilted, so one side's lower than the other, you get a, you, you, what happens is it doesn't sit on the bearing edge properly of the, of the shell. And you start getting these weird, like, buzzing overtones, and they're very difficult to get out. So if you ever find that a problem, I know it's a bit of a drag, you've got to, uh, what I find is I undo them all and start again, put them finger tight, till they're near, near all square, and then just opposites, half a turn each time. So, that's, yeah, that's, that's pretty much around the tone of, of, of the head, right? For that drum, like as a concert rack, see? Then I put the top heads on, and uh, as in true Fanny Craddock tradition, here's one I prepared earlier. <laughs> <laughs> That's, a, that's like that. <laughs> Top head, right? Now, 
you can't really tell that you have to take the top head off because you, you, you're still basically getting a drum head reacting to the, the pressure of the air inside. So you, you can't really tell that note. But I've, I, I, as I said, I prepared this one earlier. See, you can you can bend it, so you're you're not going to actually hear the note. So so you get the top head on, and then you just do the biz. Tighten them up opposites, as I said before. Now, this sometimes doesn't happen. You know, you get a click and you hear it go ping. Now, you've got to start again because the rim's not square. So, you just tighten him up, keep him going. As you bear in mind, you do this on every drum, okay? So, that's been in the walls. Look at that. A couple of tours there, right there. So, now, as you hear that, it's, it, you, you hit the drum. Now, another, a good tip is when you put a new head on it, you stretch it and you push down. Well, some people stand on it, and that's a bit silly because I've seen people do that and the skin's broken and they've gone boom, flying out. <laughs> so, like salt and pepper on it now. So, so you just basically, you fine tune it then. You just get it up somewhere like, like you want. Because the skin is settling down, it's pretty near it now. So, You've had uh, you do your phone now. You imagine this is on your drum kit, so you, you've started on the floor, Tommy. Work up, so you get the. I like to hear it like duck, 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 as, you, as you know. Some people uh, find that if they tighten, they, a lot of people I've seen and have spoken to just take the bottom head and just tighten it up at, li at random. Now the problem then is it kind of can be too tight, and uh, if you've got two drums that are different sizes and, and say the 14 inch bottom head's tighter than the 13. See what I'm saying? You're going to have a lot of problems getting the right tone between each drum. So it's, it's nice to be able to... That's how I tune a drum. Right there. Say la vie. Right. Moving on. Thank you. He's all. Here you are, mate. Now, as I said, that's the way I do it. That, it, it you know, other people, as I said, have got their own way, but that's, that's how I do it. Now, moving on, I'm going to show you... This here drum kit. Oh, by the way, we've got any girls in the audience? Ah, there's a couple up the back there, look. Uh, did you girls come together? Yeah, we did. Yeah, I'd like to have seen that. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Now, up here, as you notice, is a, is a brand new drum kit introduced by Sonal Drums. This is the baby of the line. And I introduced this drum kit out about a year ago. It's called the Force 2000, right? And on the top of the symbols, we got the Paiste Formula 2000 series. I, I actually bought a Sona drum kit when I was, uh, my very first kit I ever bought. My mother and father bought me a kit before that, which was a Broadway John Gray kit. It was, it was a bass drum, a tom-tom and a snare drum, and one little dinky cymbal on, on a sort of sucker on the bass drum. <laughs> but I bought a Sona. Now, I would thoroughly recommend to anybody this particular kit. You can start off with it, you know, start by it as a starter kit, but you could take this in the studio. It's, it's really got a nice sound to it. I'm using this, as you see it, the only ad added, added piece of equipment is this, this boom stand, which as you will notice, is black. And it came from the same family as the, the drum I just tuned up. It does come with only one cymbal stand. So I'm going to play you something on it. Have a listen to it. Aha! You little bitch.
Right, OK. All right, now you've heard it, um, I'm going to show uh, just a couple of passages that I thought was uh, pretty good to relate in the left-hand stuff. Obviously, primarily, the, the best thing to do would be, because the right hand's doing so much work, compared to this. You know, this one's giving it the welly, right? But this one's doing all the work. Now, earlier on I mentioned about being tired at gigs. How many people f have actually felt tired when they've been playing at a, sh a live show? Yeah? No? Yeah, you're over there. Yeah, I, I, I get this. Now, it's not, if you can strengthen, strengthen your left side, i.e. sit there and go... This is doing for you is say you're actually halfway through a groove and you think hang on a minute man starting to feel tired what am i going to do so or maybe you're not tired you break a stick right and you think well what am i going to do so You may say, yeah, that's all very well, but you're playing on the i -hat. It's different. True, but you might have another cymbal up there, especially if you play a kit like I do, then you can start using the cymbals. And also, a kit away from this, if you've got a bunch of tom-toms on the left side, you really need to be out to go... ..and lead with your left side. Now, pattern by changing over... going to help you. So basically what I'm saying is everything you think of, start with the left side. So like a roll, for instance. Now, basically uh, my kind of style of drumming and most rock drumming is made up of 16, 16 beats into 32. You know, and then it's a sort of a very... That sort of stuff, right? You know, nice fast fills and, I mean, also we need the space. But these are the basic makeup that go into making a real sort of rock basis for fill. So, leave, moving on from, the, from trying to strengthen the left side, there's a pattern which is very important. It's to what I think is good. It's a 16 fill. Therefore, put in the beats. I can't. This, any, how many people in here read music? Oh, there's a chat down there. Well, you can write this out for everybody in here, right? <laughs> All right. Now, and in terms of dots, I've no idea what this is. And um, my philosophy is that really you can learn to read music. It's all very, very well, and it's good for rudiments, etc., to be able to understand the basic and the makeup of a rudiment. But you can't teach Phil by dots. I don't agree. It's got to come in here. So. Um, you know, these, these things are really kind of important that you do these basic rudiments, but do them with fill. And then we can move them about. I'll just show you this one, and I'm going to go and move on to my big kit, right? But here it is, it's 16, it plays, and the accent is right, left, right, left, right, left, without breaking the... You see what I mean? So what that does is, is it's turning around. It's like a paradiddle, in fact, but it's not, because it's all singles. So it's a... And you start it with the left, like... OK, you heard me there getting faster, and you think, well, you know, I've got to be able to play it fast to make it sound cool. But believe me, uh, rudiments are not supposed to be played mega fast. I mean, it's only you, the, you, the better you get at doing them, the faster you can perform them. But always start slowly. I'm very, very, uh, I'm, I'm always, in, you know, guilty of this myself, because, you know, I like a drum feel or something, you know, or a groove. Yeah, I know it. Great, I'll get it right for the first, like, eight or nine bars, right? And then I'll go and do it again. And it's all over the place. 
So it's very important to make sure that you, your patterns are played at a, a slow tempo, and then build up to it. Never try it. I mean, it, even when you get it right, keep it lower, because it's much difficult, much more difficult to play it slow, to be honest. I find that, anyway. Now, um, I'm going to move on to the other drum kit. Here's, here's one I'll show you, which is um, it's taking the, the three accent on the 16, what we went through, and going into 32s and then bringing it back and changing the tempo. So let's go something like this. So it's like this, let's see now. does for you is it's taking it into a different phrase from 16s to 32s into the, the, the fast single stroke roll so that if you get songs in different tempos you can actually relate to it in real time if you like. Now having done that there's another pattern which is which is still working on your left side here and remember do everything starting with the left and for you guys out there with two bass drums I suggest that you do this with your left foot and so, like, if you're going to ride, ride so I can't do it because I ain't practiced this, but it would be like this, wouldn't it? <laughs> Something like that. So you sit and you, you, you practice your patterns left-handed. I mean, you don't have to turn your drum kit around. Maybe put a ride cymbal or shut the hi-hat like that, you know. And <laughs> ride left side. So you're going to strengthen your left foot up. It's very important for two bass drum players to make sure your left, left foot is as strong as the right, because you're still going to have the same problem that you do with your hand. Your, your left foot is nowhere near as, as fast or as powerful. So, um, I, I do understand we've got a couple of double bass drum players in the audience, or two pedals anyway. Uh, okay, this, this is a little pattern, which is quite fun. It, it's just a pattern. It's, it's, one, it's five actual accents on the hi-hat, and you turn it around. So you start with the right, or the left, start with the right, five accents, turn it around. It sounds like this. That, what that has, this is going to all make sense in a minute. Now, we're sort of moving on down the line now. We've, we've put a couple of passages together for the left hand, doing left hand rides, etc., getting the patterns and movement on the, the single strokes, etc. Now, this one is just changing that feel around. It's a grouping of five accents, turning it round and, and reversing it. Now, once you've got competent with it, don't worry about doing it at speed, as I said. You know, just sit in one metre. You don't have to get fast with it. Put the bass drum beat on the accent of the cymbal, or the hi-hat, and then turn it around completely so you're doing two accents on the hi-hat and one on the snare. And what this will do for you is it starts to develop the bass drum going from a single to a double beat. Somewhat, we'll cover this area with, uh, with triplets and quadruplets in a moment. Uh, but this is going to sort of strengthen the right foot as well. So this is what it sounds like, if I get it right. <laughs> does, you see, I mean, you, the faster you get with it, you're starting to get the, I mean, you're not doing that on a top kit, but your bass drum starts to work, so this is going to lead us in nicely now to ghost strokes. Now, ghost strokes, is anybody familiar with what they are? 
Yes. Well, what these are, is you've got a dro groove like this, so... Straight groove. Now, a gro ghost stroke is when you drop a double in it. You drop a beat in, and it sort of puts it a bit more lively, so it's like this. So it's sort of the same feel, but with this little inflection in there, it starts to swing it a bit more. So they're nice to know, and they come out of doing a double, mum and dad are rolls, which help you get your bounce right. Now, moving on from that, you've got your basic paradiddle, which is something that I'm really useless at playing. But these are very important to, uh, to an exercise that really gets your bass drum working for you. And I'll show you. People say, oh man, it's so boring doing rudiments, right? But Start moving them about, okay? So don't just sit on the one drum and do your rudiments. So do something like this. Start it off. So, you basically start moving it on a different drum. Then you do it with your left hand. <laughs> ah, fell over there. Right, all right. So, see what I'm doing is you start in a pattern and you use your left hand. So, that's going to start strengthening that up. Now, that's all very well. But then play it with your bass drum. So move the bass drum into what the right hand's going to play. So the right hand's going... <laughs> sorry. Right. That's what your right hand's doing. Same. Right, left, right, right, OK. Put the bell on and play the bass drum the same as the bell or the right hand. So you get this. Who's had my china type away? What's she doing over there? Get out of it. She's doing over there. Have a word with him. Right now, so okay, we've covered a double, a, a single, a double, paradiddle, right? The next thing you got is your, is your flam. And obviously, you start putting all that together and you get your flam a diddles and, uh, you know, the, the, the whittle on the wall stuff, you know. The flam is the most, really one of the most common used next to the single stroke roll in rock drumming. I mean, you get a lot of, lot of press stuff coming out, which is sort of your personality and your character is where you put it. But most of the hard rock stuff, because we're hitting the kit so hard, we really don't have a lot of time to put the bounce in for, for two press rolls or, or mama daddas or double bubbles, right? So the next stage is where we go from there with the triplet. Okay, we're going to we'll cover the flam, which is, as you probably will know, it's... The right hand accents very lightly with a, a left hand big power side like <laughs> and then a right handed or whatever way around it is <laughs> is the left hand now it's a drum <laughs> now that's just an exercise you can do at home to get used to doing a left or a right flam now you get a lot of that That gives you some idea of a makeup, how a flam would sound doing it in context or something. So, flams are very important. So, the flam I did a then, this is something that really gets me. I mean, I was only introduced to this a couple of uh, months ago, and it's a very tricky pattern to play. So, it's a flam. <laughs> and so on. That's as fast as I'm going to get it tonight, believe me. Right, this is something that you can see. 
But again, as I said, speed is really not the essence. It's being able to know how to put them together and what, what basically makes up your drum feels. As I said, feel from here is very important, but the drum feel, the selection of where you've got like your, your eight bars or your four bar break, which is your chance to express yourself, how you use it. We'll move on to that in a tick. Let me just show you something that um, I'd really like to uh, express with the bass drum side of things. Now, um, a, tri a triplet, most pl right-handed players, I mean, I start my triplet off right, left, bass drum. Uh, it's nice to start it like this. Which is, um, I beg your pardon, which is bass drum first. Then you've got a left bass drum right, which basically then turns back to right, left bass drum. But because you start it various different ways, the inflection of the snare beat starts to change the, the, the feel of the, the triplet. Likewise, putting two bass drum beats in instead of one and keeping the top hit the same can completely change the whole sound of, the, of, of what you're doing. And this is a real good exercise to get your bass drum working. So you go... All you've done there is this. So, you see what I mean? It's totally changed it. Now, you guys with two bass drums will, will do it the easy way out and put one on each bass drum. Now, that's all very well, but bearing it in mind, do it with one foot, right and left, and then if you can get your left foot working like that, think of what you're going to be able to do with two bass drums. It's not just let the left one do one beat here and there and the, the right do all the work. So, it's just a nice way of, of being able to get... I put four beats on the top and two on the bass drum. So you get a group and say it's... Okay, so it's slowly it's... Take your triplet, start doing it, and move it around, as I said. Now, that one I find very strange, because it's, it's leading with the left and then going right bass drum, which is putting it a bit in reverse from, for me. So, next time I see you, I'll work that one out and got a bit faster. But, do it right, left. Bass drum, left, right. Then right, left, bass drum. Now, you might say to yourself, well, what's all this got to do with uh, playing in a, in a band and that? Well, how many people are familiar with, with where Eagles Dare? Yeah? Well, if you remember, like the bass line, um, it's like da 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 right? I mean, if I was to sit down and play a straight groove, it would have been something like this. I mean, it's bloody disco, you know what I mean? It's like, there's no, you know, if the bass is going da 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 I mean, you've got to play with it. Anyway, Steve turned around and said, duh. I want you to play, uh, play this. I said, uh, oh, that's a nice line. Because he, he played. I said, uh, now that I know what the guitar's doing, what are you playing? He said, no, that's what I'm going to be playing. 
I said, oh, really? He says, yeah. I said, uh, what kind of drum feel are you going to put to that? <laughs> no, I was all like, hang on a minute. Give me a couple of days to think about it, you know. But uh, it's a triplet on the bass drum, basically. Now, at this particular stage in my career, I was like, I had a fast foot, but in, in, in the doubles and the singles, you know, and sticking them in all the, these weird places. But putting trip, you know, triplets in there was sort of uh, a bit adventurous, and I weren't too sure about it. But as I said to you earlier on this little passage of... Uh, playing a paradiddle, doing the right hand, this is basically what Where Eagles Dare is, because all you do, if you think about it, and play the, the accents on the bass drum, what the right hand are playing, you can come up with pretty tricky patterns, because the right side is all coordinated together, you know, it, is, it does help. If you try it with the left side and the bass drum, on the right foot, it doesn't really, doesn't work. It's sort of polyrhythm stuff, and I mean, you've really got to take a lot of effort to do that. But from a right-handed point of view, it can work out. So the, the, the where eagles there was this. has done is it's taken the into the bass drum. Now, when you, when you get used to something, you can stop doing the top work the same as the bass drum and change it, which is what I do now when we, when, the, when we last played it live, which was however many years ago. I did this now, so... Sorry. change it around. One time I'll go and then I'll write which just makes a little different flavour. It doesn't take away from the feel but it's just letting it the right hand take a few beats out and it changes it but it, in a nice way. But let me give you an example. When you, when you think about when you're playing a straight groove, okay, when you play the, chart, the, the cymbals in the top of the kit, you accent it with the bass drum. So when you're practicing at home or, or wherever, do little drum patterns where every time you, you do a major accent with your right foot, you put the bass drum in. It's something like, something like this sort of thing. Messing around, that sort of thing. See, what's happening is every time you put a major accent, you put your bass drum in, so it starts to get working faster. Now then, oh yeah, I wanted to show you something. I nicked off a of Billy Cobham. This is a cracker. It's a three beat left hand, four beat on the right. Uh, I'll do it without the bass drum, because the bass drum throws it into a different light, but this is what it sounds like. Oh, that's another thing, you guys. Uh, you've got... A what I found like with the band is that the harder you hit your kit, no matter how many lugs you have on the, you know, the lug lock systems, there are very few that really work, is your skin's slacken off. So always periodically after every maybe two or three numbers, mostly the snare goes. And, you know, you're, you're playing it one song at the end of it, boof, half the tension rod's hanging out, you know. So always keep an eye out on your tuning. Here it is. Uncle Billy, nick this one up of him. See, you can only go so well, I can only go so well. Right. 
three on the left, four on the right. You see, you get that pattern come back. Now you can start moving it around the drum kit, which is always a good exercise. Sticking the bass drum in here and there. Well, sticking it in there, I suppose. So... Okay, so that's just a little mess around. So if you've got more than uh, one, two, three, five drums, because it's very difficult to do it with just two hanging toms and a floor. Need another one up here. So, anybody got any questions? Yeah, gentleman over in the corner. What ah, good question, my man. Never thought anybody had asked. Yes. Right. Drum heads. Yeah. I use uh, Ludwig Silver Dots. I've been using them now for quite a number of years and uh, I find that they're really nice heads. They're very durable, last a while. Sometimes they crack, snap, break or whatever, like cymbals. Which is, uh, as it happens, something that I want to talk to you about now. We've got here... 17... 19... 16... 20... 18... Power Crash. Right, they're all of the brand new signature series. Right in the middle here, we've got a, a 12 inch bell symbol. That's a really, it's more of an effect symbol. It's real, just ring for ages. Lovely little symbol there. Right here is a 22 inch power ride. Next door to it, ah, next door, we're going to see in a short while. How they made this symbol for me, this one right here. This is a 20 inch power ride. Over here, we've got a 20 inch full crash. Do you know why they call it a full crash? Because <laughs> only full can hit it! <laughs> right, over here, the one that the man moved earlier on is my uh, 22 inch heavy china. They make two types of chinas in this line, a heavy and a thin. I obviously use the heavy because I hit it hard. And up here is a 22 prototype. It's not on the market yet, but it's a really nice symbol. They've, uh, I think Ian Pace has got a couple of these, and they're really nice, deep bottom ending. So I like. I usually use a 24. Uh, used to in the uh, 3000 series before the. This is the line that I use before these. At the back here, two uh, 18 inch heavy chinas, and down here, last but not least, 14 inch power hi hats. Now, moving on to the drums, these are the Sona Signature Light Series drums. They're 12-ply Burt shells, okay? And uh, this, tool, this kit you may recognise from the last Maiden tour. It's what I used uh, with the 7th uh, Sun tour. Serious drum kit, 12-ply Burt shell. Uh, that's 7 millimetres thick, although it's 12-ply. Really nice. Oh, I've got to show you this. I've got to show you this snare. Hey, old geezer, hold on to those sticks for us, would you, mate? Cheers, man. Oh, God damn it! Ah. See that? This is a six and a half inch bell bronze snare drum. Anyone familiar with the Sonor products? Have you seen the eight inch bell bronze and the piccolo four inch? Well, I fancy something that had a bit more, you know, to it. And they made me this. It's a six and a half. It's the only one in the world. And uh, it took me a bit of time to get a sound out of it, but I think it's really, really a cracking drum. Really nice. So uh, I'm just a bit proud of that because uh, it's really nice. Okay, going back to the cymbals now. Um, just before we get on with that, I want to talk a bit about wear, tear, and care of your gear. All right? I mean, we, we you know, we, we all gone through route. We, we know what we've got to do for playing. You get a nice drum kit and a nice set of cymbals, and uh, you've got to look after them, because they're damn expensive. I know I get mine given to me now, but believe me, I, only, I started at the start, I stopped buying them eight years ago. 
That's only because I've got a full endorsement with these people and I believe in their product. And uh, I know it's very expensive. But here's a, here's a standard sonal tilter, right? Now, every cymbal stand you buy comes with a sleeve in it like this. Some are small, some are not so long. And they're very easy. These ones are pretty stuck on here, but they wear out. And when I'm talking about other cymbal stands, now what happens is you lose them. You've got your felt on there, right? So the threaded part, the cymbal starts rocking up and you get a keyhole effect in it. And then your cymbals, it's naff, it does your cymbal up. Okay? So always make sure you've got these sleeves. Now if you, you know, you go to your drum store and a guy goes, yeah man, I've got one of them, 80p, or a quid for a little bit of this. Don't bother, go down your pet shop and get some of this. It comes in massive lengths. So you, all it is is plastic tube what they put oxygen into fish tanks. And that fits snugly over there. Okay? You're going to love me all these drum stores, ain't they? So what happens, this wears out too, but the thing is, if you've got a whole great length of it for a couple of quid, or every night, you just make sure that you've got your sleeve on there and it'll, set, it'll protect the inside of the, the hole in the cymbal. Also, there is a right way and a wrong way to set your cymbals up. If you notice my cymbals, they're all slightly tilted because they're so high. Now, what's that, what, the reason for that is, can I have a stick, mate? From when I'm sitting behind them, if they're square, if you imagine it's square like that, when you hit it with a stick, all the impact is going straight through the cymbal right into the middle of the cymbal. So it puts very weird stresses within the, st the structure of the metal. It'll only last so long and then it'll crack. So if you set your, set your cymbal stand at a slight angle, it feels weird for a while, because it took me a long time to get used to it. This was going back a few years. And I was cracking cymbals all over the shop, you know, I mean like, because I had them all square. So when you, when you have it at an angle, when you hit it, Right? It, it, the stick is actually gets more of an angle across it and the actual impact goes around through the cymbal. So it's very important to make sure that A, you have the sleeve and two, that they're angled. Don't tighten them up too much on the crashes. The rides have to be tight. If you look at this one up here, I mean, it's, it's pretty tight. It's not like a crash like this one. So I have to have a lot of movement in them. Anyway, <laughs> I did introduce you to my cymbals earlier and it gives me great pleasure to take you all now on a journey to Switzerland, to the factory where they're made. I showed you my 20-inch power ride that's up there, so we're now going to go and take a look at how they made this symbol for me. As you can gather, it's, uh, it's rather wet. Uh, it was rather sunny earlier on, but nevertheless, um, we're still in one of the most beautiful parts of Switzerland that I've personally ever been to, and I'm sure you'll agree. Uh, we're in Notville, in Switzerland, and uh, I'm standing, as you can see, next to the sign of the Paiste Symbol Manufacturers. And in this building behind me is the factory where they produce the Formula Series, and amongst others, and of course, the new Paiste Signature line, which you've already seen upon my drum kit. So without further ado, let's go and see how they make my symbol. Aha, Stefan, my friend. How are you? Good to see you again. I'm oh, fine, my friend. Thanks very much. Right, just a word before we, we carry on. Um, this short video that you're about to see is an edited version of how long it takes or how to manufacture from this a symbol. Now, uh, it, there's no specific time given to, oh, it takes six hours to start to finish to make that particular symbol. There's so many quality controls that have to be looked at that you, you can't time it. But um, for purposes of our video today, we're going to kind of have an edited version, as I said. So without further undo, undo, ado, <laughs> let's get on with it. Right, after casting and rolling, this is what we get. We get the basic plate, which is like so. Now, this is the brand new, world patented signature line raw material. So, I think it's about time we went on a journey with this symbol, where it's not as a, yet a symbol, right? And see how they make for me this particular symbol. So, let's go. Ah, da, 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 da. Zaza, zaza. 
I saw all that. <laughs> now you see it. <laughs> now you don't. Ta-da, symbol. I'll see you at the other end, mate. Ta-da. All right. Oh, man. Look at the colour of the damn thing. Look at this. Well, I'll be like, wow. Woo, it's hot. Yeah, you, you can fry an egg or two on that, I'll tell you. Now, we're going to... There you go. This machine here is, is punching the bell in the symbol. This is the only automated part of the process, apart from putting a hole in the middle. Wow, would you look at that? Now, that, that look good? Yeah, there you see the bell? Now, we, we have got a slight problem. We haven't got a hole in the middle. <laughs> so I guess we better go and punch the, the hole in. Anyway, here's Stefan and I are here at the moment at this machine, which is going to punch the hole in the middle. As you saw earlier, we put the bell in the symbol, but we haven't got a hole. So, Stefan, if you wouldn't mind, thank you. Voila. Look at this. Thank you, my friend. Well, there you have it. The symbol with the hole. Isn't that good? You think that was funny, don't you? Well, look at that. That's not bad as it happens, is it? Well, you know what? You guys out there think I've got a real good deal with Pisty, don't you? That they give me all my stuff. Well, they've got me making my own now. No, seriously. It is very difficult to hammer a symbol. So, I think I'm going to hand you over right now to a professional so we can see how it's really done. As you can see, the symbol is, uh, in fact, a different colour from when we were upstairs putting the bell and the hole in it. Um, as I said, we, we had to edit this piece of film and we haven't got time to show it, but that symbol there, which is my symbol, has uh, been dipped in a tub of acid to remove all the, the carbons, etc., and the treatment colours which it received through the oven. Now, Zeppi here, he's an old pro at this. Uh, it's, believe me, it's very, very difficult. It, it takes about four years of intense training to be able to manufacture the hammering on each of these symbols. There you go. Well, I'll be blown. Look at that. Now, as you see, Zeb is checking out the form, the pro form of the symbol, before he goes on and makes sure there's no real kinks in there, which there aren't. Oh, by the way, over here, let me just show you. This here is the uh, master symbol, which we'll, we'll be looking at. Now, Zeppi takes a look at the form of that and compares the hammered symbol that he's just done on the first round, just to make sure that the form is right. We'll talk more about these master symbols a little long, along the line. This is the first real quality control area, if you like. Look at that. Wonderful. Okay, checking the form and depth, etc. Uh, look fine. Uh, fine tuning right there. You know, it's not just a case of just hammering it and looking at it, making it look even. It's making sure that the, the form is the same around the whole of the symbol before it goes to the next stage. Great. Excellent. Zep, thank you, my friend. That's excellent, really. Okay, next step, we're going to go down to the hand. This is a hand hammering too. There is another stage of hammering. Let's go and check it out. Follow me. Hey, hey, it's most of me. Oh, yeah, the prototype. Right. Cheers, Zep. See you later. All right. Oh, dearie me. You know, I don't have money about that. Always. All right, watch out. All right, John, how's the wife? Yeah, sweet. Oh, how these boys handle all this noise all day, I've no idea. 
Well, look at that. All right, Fred. Uh, oh, Fred. Oh, John, how's the wife? All right? Good stuff, mate. Well, look at that. Well, now we move to the next stage. Paul, my man. The man who hammers it by hand. How you doing, man? Good to see you again. How's things? This is my friend. I know you're, you're uh, in amongst the 16 power crashes of the new signatures, but would you please be so kind as to hammer and finish that off for me, please? Here you go, my friend. And uh, I've brought with me the master. Here you go. Now, what Paul's doing is he's checking it out. Uh, he knows the depths and tolerances to this symbol from the master. So he's going to make sure that it sits flat and that uh, the symbol is then going to be ready for the next stage, which is the lading. Now, every symbol that is manufactured here at the Feisty Factory goes through Paul or the other gentleman. There's two guys. There's Paul and one chap next door who I haven't met yet. Uh, every symbol goes through one or the other's hands as a hand-hammered, hand-finished symbol. We've seen a hand-hammered symbol. Although the, the machine is actually pushing the, the pin up and down, it actually does the work, but it's still hand-hammered. This is the final stage of the hammer. Now, Paul was, there you go. Is he ready? Well, ter oh, that was really terrific. Now, that must go to show you how the other chap did his job on the machine. So anyway, thank you, my friend. I'll take the master with me. God bless you, Paul. Thanks very much, and I think it's time my symbol's starting to look better and better all the time. It's time for us to move on. Let's go up to the lading area. Eddie! Hey, man. How are you? Good. Could you turn my symbol for me, please? Thanks a lot, man. Terrific. Well, right here, this is the last but two stage, if you like. Eddie's now going to spin the symbol and lathe it. We've just been downstairs, as you've noticed, and we've fine-tuned the symbol in its hammering stage. And now Eddie is going to spin it a few times, which is really the last heavy process that we've got to take care of. You've all heard the groove on these symbols, boys and girls, right? You've heard it. Now we're going to be watching it put onto the symbol. In other words, what Eddie's going to do is put the grooves on the symbol. Finishing touches. There they come. Look at that. Whoa. Hear the groove. Feel the groove. Yeah. Whee I think the last stage of this turning and lathing is the cup and the bell. Wonderful, look at this. Shaping up that bell. As you know, the ride cymbals, they take a, a heck of a lot of the, the power of the stroke when you hit them. And the one thing about these cymbals is that and now that there was a group, the final turning system is that you cannot overpower them. They won't reach a crescendo and you'll get weird overtones. This is the beauty of these new symbols. One of the beautiful things. Eddie, terrific. Wow, look at that. Woo! Cheers, my friend. Thanks very, very, very much. That was a pleasure to watch you work. Well, we're just a couple of stages away from being able to hear this baby. So I think it's time we went and checked the last but one stage out. Hi, Avold. Hello, my Hi. friend. How are you? Could you stamp my symbol up for me, please? Thank you. Well, Avold's just about... Uh, there you go. Brilliant. Stamping of my symbol is now complete. Avard, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Well, now then, look here. You lot, people. There is my symbol. Finished. Stamped. Logo. My, the story of my Power Ride 20 inch. Well, there's one thing left. One very important 
quality control that is left. You've seen the master that has been accompanying my symbol around the factory. We've now got to go and have this symbol tested. This is the last stage before it would be, in other words, shipped out to a store or to whoever would be buying it. But we have to test it. So let's go and see what happens. Good, yes, yeah. Listen, my friend, uh, the boys have just finished my symbol for me, and I would yeah. love it if you would test it for me. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, thanks. Yeah? yeah. Oh, great. Uh, yeah, thing? okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, look here. Here we are, the final stage. Uh, your gear is one of the two testers of the cymbals. This is the final quality control. Before I play this, I've just got to tell you that every stage of the cymbal manufacturing process we've been through today, we've seen the quality control, i.e. to this, to this master cymbal. This was the, the master cymbal that was designed and prototyped and then decided this was the master cymbal that every specification from every other cymbal had to be made to, hence they're all very similar. That is because of the quality control that has been through every stage. We've seen the fine tuning, we've seen the turning, we've seen everything else that's gone into it. A couple of, mom a couple of areas we've missed, but anyway, let's hear this baby. This is brilliant. Get you cranked up here a bit now. Look at that was brilliant, wasn't it? That was really interesting. Anybody got any questions? Yeah, you sir. What's ah? Oh, good, good question. Yeah, I mean you've got a nice drum kit. Still, you've got to have something to whip them with. I mean, you can't hit them with your head all the time, can you? Okay, I, I have a set of a uh, pair of sticks here that are made for me by uh, the drum drumstick manufacturers from Sheffield, up that part of the world, and they're made by Shaw Sticks, and they're American Hickory. And uh, they made a model for myself, and um, I'm very proud and privileged to have a good relationship with them. These are market, they do sell these, but they also sell various models, other kinds of sticks, and also, uh, yeah, we've got, we got some um, bits here. Geezer, come over here. Ah, well, well, will you welcome Steve Gadigan and Bill Barkley, Dave Murray's Guitar Tech. Yeah. yeah. Lovely. Do you, do you, do you, right now, look here. This, this is just a, a, a few, in fact, of, uh, we've got a few other display balls, but we couldn't bring them all out, is there so many? Over here, you see, you see, they make all kinds of stuff. Timpani sticks, hand-sewn felt sticks, all down to all, 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 all purpose mallets down the bottom. You know, phew, take that. Right, over here, these are the personalised sticks, like, like my ones that have got your name. You can get, uh, get your own name put on sticks. It costs a few bob to get the dye that, or the, the, the press that makes, you know, all the... Bits and pieces. There's a few. Who we got there? Filthy Thrashers. You know who that is, don't you? Filthy Thrashers. Yes, yes, it's Lemmy's boys. Up here is all the line uh, of every other kind of stick that are, are manufactured by... Uh, I think there are some more, as I said, but these are the main kind of areas. They're, they're categorised by A, B, C, D, all the way down through 1A, 2A, pretty much on the European or American standard sort of sticks. So there's something for everybody here. Yeah? Brilliant drum. They're the best sticks I've ever used. And I ain't saying that because I do a deal. I've been, I've been buying these for over 25 years of this company. And, and uh, it's just nice that we've become to have a nice arrangement. But they are the best. I find that these sticks, um, unlike some other manufactured sticks, when you break them or they break, they don't snap. And they season their wood very, very well. It's, it's really good quality stuff. And then they roll them. And they're, they're really like dead square, you know. So, I mean, you couldn't see that, but I'm just making sure that they weren't bent. <laughs> now, and they're very good weight. And now, that's a very important thing to a pair of sticks. Sometimes you can pick a pair of sticks up, and one's lighter than the other. Oh, that's terrible, isn't it? How many times has that happened, yeah? 
Pick them up, Miss. Are you awake? There you go. It's your sticks. Nico, what type of microphones do you use? Ah, good question. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, actually, the microphones that I use are actually one of the, what I think are one of the best quality mics you can get. Um, they're, the same they're the same microphones as I'd take in the studio, and they're made by, ba made by Bayer Dynamic. And uh, that brings me on. We just saw the film about how they, make my, how they made that 20-inch ride symbol for me. That was great, wasn't it? So uh, let's take a little trip down to uh, Deutschland, a little place just uh, outside Stuttgart, and we're going to go and see how they make a microphone. I'm actually standing in the grounds of the Bayer Dynamic Microphone Manufacturing Company here in Heilbronn, which is about 35 miles north of Stuttgart. Well, we're going to go inside in a little while and meet a few friends of mine, and uh, they're going to show me around and you around the factory to show you how they manufacture microphones. I've got with me the uh, manager of the advertising and marketing division of Bayer Dynamic, Mr. Heinz Fogel. And, uh, Good mate of mine. We had a couple of drinks last night, didn't we, mate? <laughs> it's really awesome. Never mind. Um, okay, Heinz. Uh, we have down on the table some uh, very interesting bits and pieces. Could you describe what's happening down here? Yeah, the parts are lying on that table. <coughs> That's uh, the parts we are using for the microphones or mm -hmm. for the headphones. We just get the rough material and then we start to produce each part okay, of that microphone yeah. here. So everything we see on the table then is actually manufactured here in the factory. That's Every, right. Everything, yeah. and yeah. so all the machining is done as well. And yes. I'm, so, I'm amazed actually at how many, how many bits and pieces actually go into making a microphone. I mean, I'm, I'm astounded. I mean, I get to just use them, you know. Um, it, this is fascinating. So um, this microphone, this is a 740, isn't yes, it? Yes, the MC740. That's right. That's that's, uh, these are ones uh, that I use for my ambient <coughs> sound, <coughs> overheads, and uh, actually, on, as you notice, maybe you astute fellow chaps out there at the end of this video, I'll see the brass section are using these. 740, what else have we got? And this, the 201. Ah, the 201, that's that's my baby that I use on my Tom Toms. Oh, this, this is a 422, yes. right. This is my snare drum mic. Everybody, so you now you know what you're you hearing that serious sound that my snare drum comes over this. <laughs> well, I think it's about time, I think, every boy, boys and girls, to run upstairs and see how they put all this together. Is that okay with you? Yeah, okay. Okay, let's go. Well, Heinz, uh, this looks very much like the technical drawing area, so uh, could you explain what happens here? Yeah, that's the construction office where mm -hmm. everything starts. Yeah. Before you build a microphone, you need a draft mm -hmm. and you can do that draft by computer or by hand okay over here this looks like the <coughs> the drawings for the 480 handheld that i had earlier on is, is this the drawing for it this is the drawing for the tgx 480 right wonderful well of course obviously i guess once the drawings have been constructed and, and put down to paper you, we need to take them down to the shop floor that's right and yeah. uh, let the guys start making the microphone yeah so, uh, well, listen, thanks for bringing us up here. I'm, okay. I'm going to take everybody downstairs now you and show them how they put it together. I'll catch you at the end. Okay. See you later. Right, people, here we are in the storeroom where they store the raw material. This stuff that's in here comes in from outside. It's contracted out. Uh, there's one other area, which is the wire that goes into the transformer of the microphone. That is made outside. Everything else you're about to see in the assembly process is made here in-house at the Bayer Dynamic Factory. Got some here. <laughs> this is before, right? This is after. Put that in my pocket. And this is the day after. <laughs>
you seen uh, Jennifer put the coil or the wire into the transformer, which was quite, quite stunning. Uh, oh, yeah, here's one we prepared earlier. <laughs> I've heard that one already today. And um, it's quite amazing, it's really, actually, when you, the intricate detail and work that uh, it's almost like jewelry, you know, like watchmaking, you know, little instruments and bits and pieces. <laughs> Well, there you go. The finished product. My uh, M201 microphone, one of 11, which I shall be using. Uh, there is one stage left that every microphone that's produced here has to go through, and that's the testing. So uh, I think it's about time we uh, did the off to the testing room, don't you? OK, let's go. Hey, hi, Heinz. How you doing? Nice to see you again. Ah, very good. Hello, my darling. How are you? Oh. Heinz, yeah. this is it. This is the end of the journey, I guess. My microphone's finished. Would you ask Veerika if she'll test that for me? Of course. Please? Thank you. Please, you test it for him? Yeah, oh, I've got another ten of those to go with that, so. Are you in the prime Arctic? Are you in the prime Arctic? Ah, Villarica, thank you very, very much. Heinz, thanks for a terrific day, and thank you to thanks everybody who's helped us out to make this film for the factory and all the governors and everybody. It's been a pleasure to see you. I'll catch thank you again you real soon. Thank you for visiting us. See you later. Well, now then. That's it. That's the story of my microphone. So I suppose there's only one thing for it now, is to get this baby back to the studio. Right, you know we were talking about stamina, OK? Well, there's an area that, that you know, when you, when you get a bit tired, OK, it's all very well. We were talking about being out to play left-handed and switching and changing. Well, that's all very well. But you really have to try and, and, and breathe through the show. So you, you get a song where, like, say for instance, Maiden, I know it was only the second or third song into our set, but Infinite Dreams intro is really quite an easy, you know, laid back sort of groove. Now, there's certain areas in probably everybody's songs where you can lay back a bit, right? Now, dealing with this, it's, it's important to know these areas because when you play live, instead of in rehearsal, like or what I was playing, I mean, when the band come out later, I'll probably be going bananas, but in a rehearsal situation, you, you, you do give it a bit of welly, but you never hit the kit the same as you do live. Just take a look at this. Just a piece of film to show you that, I mean, when I'm playing live, uh, 
the old drumstick sort of pretty much back here. I mean, there are certain things you can, can you, you, you get into, but you, you've got to be a bit quick, so you can't. But the energy is in there. And what happens is, if you do that for an hour and 40 minutes on stage every night, it might, if you don't pace yourself, there are times when it's just, like, too hard to keep it going. So, you, like for me, I mean, and I find that for a lot of people I've spoken to, they find this problem. So it's a question of pacing yourself and knowing where you can sort of leave it out a bit and sort of uh, Nancy boy the shot, you know? <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, it's quite important if you're playing heavy metal or heavy rock and roll power and power, when you're powering through the drum kit, you've got to give it your space. It's all very well getting out there and uh, giving it 400%, which is what we all want to do, but there are times when if it's like a hard, fast songs all the time, you can get tired, especially when you're out on tour for a while. It's all right, maybe starting off, you know, there may be a problem later on. So what I'm saying is to you, learn how to pace yourself. Because this is what I have to do. Maybe it's because I'm getting old, but, I, you know, I've always done that. You're, not, you're supposed to say no, Nick. You ain't that old, are you? Right, no. Make me feel good, come on. No, um, so it's, it's, it's pretty important to pace yourself. I find that anyway. Now, who asked me about my bass drum pedal earlier on? You asked me about me speaking, didn't you? Okay, let, uh, moving on over here. Although I use uh, Ludwig speakings, I want to talk about a bit of all you guys out there. That have, this is a, the, the pedal that goes with the, the Sonar Force 2000. They sell these for... It's a really nice pedal. But one thing about your pedals that you must really concentrate on, is if you want to get speed, you've got to have a quick back release or a quick release off the head. So I know I need a flat surface. Um, yeah, well, this will do. Right. So, when that's on the ground, okay, the best way to check your, check your tensioning on your pedal that I found is to do this. Okay, now see how it, it's, it, it responds real well. I mean, it takes a while. That's a good spring tension. But some people's pedals do this. Or, oh, hang on, I can't, I can't show because it's... Let's take that off. Okay. Right, so this may be yours. So it goes down and it goes. <laughs> 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 hey, yes. Oh, what a fool. Right, so there's your bass drum head. So it goes, it's hit the bass drum and it comes about like that. Boom. Boom. It's real, it's real. There's no actual spring in it. Now, if you don't have a good release back, now, I'm not talking about it being mega tight, so you've got to real push it, <laughs> really push it down hard, because that defeats the point too, because your foot's got to do a hell of a lot more work if it's too strong. So it should really be quite a relaxed feel. This one, I, this one is what I would play it at, actually. And this is just a good way of checking. You don't even have to do this. You could just pull it back, pull your pedal back, Feel the tension and go like that. As long as it rocks good, you know you've got a pretty good tension. You're going to get that, that boy coming back quick. So you can get all the speed out of it. It's just a little point to deal with tensioning. As I said, my, my old Speedy, you know, I have to um, oil up on the bearings. And these are great because there's not a lot of moving parts other than on the back of yours. As, as mine's got a, an extra plate at the back, as I was saying earlier. So just a tip, maybe, for anybody that maybe have, has a, what I call a sloppy bass drum pedal. It won't really work fast for you. In fact, you won't get it working at all if it hasn't got any tension in it to come back off the head pretty quick. So, without further ado, I think it's about that time to bring on some very special friends of mine. We have actually been uh, talking us various, various theory bits and pieces this evening. You know, little patterns. Got them right, got them wrong, who knows? But that, the main thing is, We've covered all the areas that I wanted to get into, which is your stamina. A couple of little patterns for people that are just starting off, you know, this left hand business. So, it just uh, needs to wind it up now and put it all into practice. Shall we have a little bit of music? Yeah, yeah all right. I'd like to introduce to you my very good friend Martin Colony on bass, please, everybody. <laughs> hey. And uh, my very good friend and cohooting partner, who I'm sure you will recognise, Mr. Dave Murray. And the man whose acquaintance I only made a couple of months ago, or maybe five or six months ago, at a drum clinic I did in Tunbridge World. Nice warm welcome, Mr. Mike Moran, please. <laughs> Mike, uh, Mike has been responsible.
for the horn arrangement that you are about to hear, and I would like to introduce to you four very amazing horn players, saxes and trumpets. On trumpet, Mr. Steve Sidwell and Mr. Simon Gardner, please. <laughs> Followed up closely behind them on alto sax, Mr. Andy McIntosh, and on tenor sax, Mr. Dave Bishop. We'll see you later. We're going to do a little song that Davey and I uh, wrote about a year ago. It's called Rhythm of the Beast.
Thank you.